Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Aaron Simmons, the president of the Soaring Turkey Guard Society USA, and I'm excited to bring you tonight a virtual symposium entitled Turkey Guardian Resources for Living Through a Pandemic. Let me offer just a few words as a way of opening. First, Kierkegaard reminds us that we should be wary of speculative abstraction and instead focus on the realities, struggles, joys, and frustrations that constitute lived existence. In my own life, I've often said that it is Kierkegaard who has allowed me to remain a Christian, but perhaps I should also add that it is Kierkegaard, at least as presented by my former teacher, David Kangas, who taught me what matters about the practice of philosophy, namely careful and nuanced thinking in the service of an engaged, earnest, and invested life. As such, this symposium is not an attempt to make our favorite thinker everything to everyone. That is, in fact, a dangerous way to approach any thinker because it invites us to become disciples rather than conversation partners, especially in a time when political loyalty is increasingly a litmus test for communal belonging, Kierkegaard reminds us that we must remain more committed to truth than to our own preferences. Accordingly, this symposium is meant to be an opportunity for a group of distinguished scholars to think together and model what it looks like for philosophy not simply to be applicable to the so-called real world, but actually stand as an invitation to consider what world we can together make real. Philosophy for the Greeks was a way of life. And yet in the contemporary world, it has often just become a good way to get into law school. That said, in times of crisis, times like these in this pandemic, we are often thrown back upon the bedrock of our existence in ways that reveal what has always mattered and also allows us to interrogate the idols of our own making that may never have mattered in the first place. I am joined today by four amazing thinkers, all of whom have helped me to understand Kierkegaard as well as the idea and practice of living well. First, Ada Yarzma, the philosophy department at Mount Royal University. Second, Christopher Barnett, Department of Theology and Religious Studies at Villanova University. Third, Sergia Hay, philosophy department at Pacific Lutheran University, and currently the American Philosophical Association representative for the Soren Kierkegaard Society. And finally, Vanessa Rumble in the philosophy department at Boston College and a former Soren Kierkegaard Society president. Thank you all for being with me. I am genuinely honored to have you here and excited to hear your thoughts on how Kierkegaard can offer resources for living through this very strange time in which we find ourselves. The way this symposium is going to work is that each of our participants will have 10 minutes to offer just some genuine reflections and general ideas about how Kierkegaard can help us where we find ourselves and also help us move forward in productive ways. Our first participant is Ada Yarzma. So Ada, take it away. Thank you so much. This is such a pleasure to be meeting with you all. I, uh, I'm in Southern Alberta. And so I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. I'm here on the lands of the uh, traditional Blackfoot Confederacy and the people of Treaty 7 and Métis Nation Region 3. And one of the things we tend to say here in Southern Alberta is that we are all Treaty 7 people. And that's a line that brings with it some challenges related to habit. So habit is what I'm going to be offering a reflection on in relation to Kierkegaard. Um, so we are all Treaty 7 people are we all Treaty 7 people? <laughs> There's a generalizing um, ethics there that I think Kierkegaard can really help us think maybe even against. So I'm going to actually conclude my little talk by talking about that. Um, but there's also simply a problem with habit when something moves, say, from a ritual to becoming just rote or routine. It's, it loses the transformative impact or even the ethical imperative that it should have. So we tend to do land acknowledgements now in Canada, but we're increasingly kind of worrying about the state of the habit, the habitual nature of it. And I personally cannot think of a better thinker than Kierkegaard to confront us with the power of habit and also the problem of habit. Um, and also, I, I feel like this is a fair statement. It strikes me that all of us are right now just really up close and personal with our habits. You know, we're at home, we're thinking about what we eat and how we cook it, 
how we relate to those around us and those who are virtually you know, in community with us, um, how we structure our time. I think so many things are open now, but also maybe even more constrained. And it strikes me that this is the one of the marvelous tensions that Kierkegaard is so good at staging for us and, and inviting us to feel implicated in. So on the one hand, habit can, it can feel so like mechanical that it almost feels like an accident. Like I did that thing because the rhythm brought me there, but I don't feel like I chose it. But habit can also be so profoundly, we could even say full of agency. You know, like, I don't know what you, what you all are doing right now in terms of movement. I keep signing up for new newsletters about how to exercise at home. <laughs> and sometimes it's working and sometimes it's not. And that makes me feel really like um, uh, grappling with the, with the question, which is a, it's a religious question and an existential question. Why do I not do what I want to do? And how can I do what I don't want to, you know, why, why don't I do what I do want to do? You know, the, the problem of the will. So that's what I'm really going to be talking about a little bit here. Um, on the one hand, these are going to be really practical questions about how we are in part, what we do, you know, our habits, um, but they're also really existential. So thinking about how when our habits are getting, how we're confronting them, we're needing to confront them. We're also really questioning and having to question things about the future, about time, about meaning, what does it mean to be in school and teach right now? What will it look like even in a few months from now? And this is also why I think Kierkegaard is, is such a marvelous thinker for us to be talking about right now, because he is a thinker of despair, which is also to say a thinker of hope. So that's what also I'll be, I'll be drawing us into conversation about. And I'm gonna do this, um, I hope that this will, will work for you. I'm gonna do this in the form of a little lesson. So I've been teaching Kierkegaard actually all winter, and this is a little strand of what we talked about in our class, and we all found ourselves connecting the pandemic to Kierkegaard. So I'll be making those connections for you now, and I hope that you will find them as, as edifying and generative as my students and I did. Welcome to my short lesson on connecting Kierkegaard to the pandemic. You know, there are so many books that we could turn to from Kierkegaard. I'm just choosing one. It happens to be one of my favorites. It's also one of the ones that students do find the most exasperating because at first glance, it seems so abstract. It's basically like an algebra, algebraic equation for what it means to be a self. And so I'm going to look at this with you once, twice, and then a third time in the hope that the third time is when it really starts to come alive for us. So it's, a, it's an algebraic equation that has different functions. So we can almost imagine this as either a poem or a math equation. And if we begin with the first function of this equation, I won't read it. Instead, I'll invite you to contemplate an understanding of yourself as not one thing, as not a bounded thing, but as, as an assemblage or a collage or the term, we're reading it in English here, the term in this passage here is a synthesis. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So you are an assemblage of, of various things. The next function has this amazing word at the beginning of it, and the word is if. And what that means is, this equation of selfhood could actually stop before it even began. It could stop at, okay, I am made up of many things. But then there's this beautiful second function, which begins with an if, which is basically a promise of a possibility that I am increasingly thinking of in terms of self-compassion. I can relate to my collage or my relations. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as well, that this pandemic is an opportunity to relate to our relations. And then the third function is where we can really hear that this is a religious text, that if the self is relating to its own relations, then there's this possibility of what Kierkegaard would call faith. And there's this formula for faith resting transparently in the power that established me. And I'm gonna offer a few different translations of that formula in my conclusion. And so back to the beginning, the first part of this equation, I am a collage or an assemblage or a set of syntheses. Now these words are really abstract, but what's so beautiful about abstraction is that we get to relate to them in very concrete ways. And what I especially love about this portrait of being a self is how singular it is. 
it's not going to be the same for you as for your family members or anybody in your community. Um, it's also dynamic. So my strong sense is that if we did this, it's basically like an exercise we're doing right now. If we did this half a year ago, your understanding of your relations would be so different than it is right now in part because of the habits, the habits that we're confronting and hopefully changing. So if you just glance over these sets of relations or syntheses, look at how there's some openness and also some givenness, and there's tension between them, and there's a lot of drama. Drama in terms of where there might be a new value or new ideal that you can be tuning into, or where there's something that you've inherited that is gaining extra meaning, or is feeling more constraining. There's, that's the tension of the first synthesis. The second, it strikes me that we are all grappling with this strong sense of, of uncertainty in an open future, but also maybe feeling more attuned to the past or where we've come from. My, I don't know what your parents are doing during this time. My dad is scanning my mother's scrapbooks of many, many decades and sending me these scanned portraits of me at, as a six-year-old. <laughs> and it's been really great to kind of figure out my own relation to that self of the past. And then the third synthesis, the fact that there, are, there is openness in my choices, but also these imperatives. I think this can be really... Um, incredibly mundane right now. So my laptop died the other day and I'm feeling really um, stuck in terms of this, this tension between what I can do and, and necessity, but it also can be existential or even we could say spiritual. So I'm thinking a lot these days about vocation or I, I attend Quaker meeting. And so the, the word that Quakers love is um, a leading. I'm hoping for a leading. And I think Kierkegaard would situate that there, the synthesis between freedom and necessity. Just to remind you that this formula is about the relations, but then this possibility of relating to the relations, but it doesn't stop there. Then there's this kind of grander hope, which is, well, in what then do I, ultimately, if I didn't create myself, and I am relating to something beyond me, what does that look like and how does it change me? So I'm going to end here with a little um, a passage from a queer Indigenous poet in Canada, Billy Ray Belcourt. And Billy Ray writes, and doesn't this sound so much like the sickness unto death? The body, we could say the self, the body is an assemblage, a collage of everyone who's ever moved us for better or worse. But here's the thing, it can be so easy not to be moved. And it strikes me as part of Kierkegaard's description of despair and the kind of intense despair that transforms us and connects us to others and to something beyond us, it, that is a portrait of being moved. And that is not a neutral thing. So if you are indigenous, if you are a settler like me, being moved is gonna be very different. It's gonna implicate us differently. And this is why I tend to think about Kierkegaard as unlike say Nietzsche or Freud, who critiqued a lot from without, Kierkegaard is a, is a critic from within which means that we, we can implicate ourselves in the systems we're part of. And this is what the pandemic is doing. You know, are we going to wear masks? Are we going to go to the store? Are we gonna, who are we going to social distance with? And now laws are changing. And so we are all on the hook for making these really profoundly important and difficult questions. And so the end of his, of Anticlimicus, the sickness under death, the end of this formula is resting transparently in the power that established me. We might call that God. My mother would call that God. Habermas, a wonderful contemporary philosopher, calls that language. Being moved and resting transparently in what he calls the transubjective powers. Simone de Beauvoir calls that the we. I am all ultimately always moved by the we. And I'll just be honest, I move between all of those translations. And I hope for all of you that this pandemic is a time to not only relate more to yourself in self-compassion, but also to find yourself moved in a way that will connect you to the divine or to community or to language and your own art practice or whatever it is that you are doing in the hopes that this will really sustain you in this time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ada, so much for that lesson, the invitation to think with you. And I should say it's strange to do these sorts of things uh, because we, we are sort of like comedians without an audience. And of course, uh, those of us who have been in the academy very long have probably given talks when there were more people on the panel than in the audience. <laughs> so in this case, uh, we'll assume there's this uproarious applause and cheering and air horns behind us. So really well done. Thank you, Ada. 
uh, to our viewers, we'll come back and have a discussion at the end among all of our participants. And so we're going to move now to our next presenter, and this is Chris Barnett. Chris, the floor is yours. Tough act to follow, a very organized presentation. I'm going to be sort of more off the cuff here, but uh, I've, I've thought a great deal uh, like Ada. I, I wasn't teaching Kierkegaard uh, explicitly this uh, winter, but uh, obviously always in my mind, and I've been thinking a great deal as the, the crisis has unfolded um, about a lot of Kierkegaard's thoughts, whether they pertain to, let's say, a book like Works of Love and, and what it means to love the neighbor. But probably more explicitly for me, I've been really thinking about uh, his analysis of technology. And some of that is a little bit, it has a lot to do, I should say, with some of the work I've been doing. I published uh, in August, I came out with a book called uh, Kierkegaard and the Question Concerning Technology uh, with Bloomsbury Academic. And it strikes me that the book is very relevant. I've actually sent a couple of emails to other scholars publishing in the field kind of saying like, you know, there, there are a lot of them are sort of sounding off on Twitter and what have you. You should read this person. Or you should read that person. And I'm like, you should read Kierkegaard. <laughs> you know, like he has a lot to say about uh, these uh, issues, I think. Um, and a lot of the interest for me anyway in connecting Kierkegaard to technology began when I started teaching a course at Villanova called God, Spirituality, and Technology. And of course, I assigned all the usual sort of, you know, main players in, in the philosophy of technology, especially in its humanities iteration. So Martin Heidegger, Jacques Ellul, uh, Hans Jonas. Uh, and then I also assigned more popular texts, like Sherry Turkle's books on uh, the use of social media or uh, Nicholas Carr's uh, book called uh, What is the Internet Doing to Our Brains? I think it's The Shallows, technically. What is the Internet Doing to Our Brains? And anyway, along the lines you know, of, of, of that, I mean, I, I started seeing connections. Uh, it's some rather obvious and then some more sort of subtle in Kierkegaard's thought. And I kind of wondered, like, you know, to what extent did Kierkegaard interact with technology? Now, my, my old uh, doctoral supervisor, George Pattison, has written some about uh, these issues, like uh, connecting Kierkegaard, for example, to uh, Deer Park, right? Which uh, those of you who've been to Copenhagen have probably ventured out to Deer Park before. And we all know that in the postscript, Kierkegaard envisions an outing to Deer Park and how can one relate to God in the midst of such sort of bourgeois comforts and so on. Uh, but I thought there might be more uh, in the journals than that. Um, and uh, that's sort of where this whole project for me took off. And, and ultimately, I sort of hit on that, that Kierkegaard had a lot to say, usually in the journals, occasionally more subtly in the authorship, about modern transportation. Uh, about modern communication, that's the more obvious one, I think. And then also about urbanization. I mean, a lot of times we assume that his notion of the crowd is a kind of abstract, you know, sort of concept. But we forget that, you know, he lived in a time of, of great urbanization, uh, not just in, in Europe, but also in Denmark. And he was very much aware of, of how the city was changing our, our consciousness and so on. And it strikes me that a lot of the themes that have emerged out of the COVID-19 crisis are related to precisely those issues, right? I mean, on the one hand, we know about uh, how sort of global technology uh, and mo massive modern transport easily transports illness and, and disease around the world. Uh, we've seen the airline industry hit hard by this very thing. Uh, when it comes to urbanization, we know cities are hit the hardest, right? And, and a place like New York City, you know, has, has experienced a great deal of, of, of crisis due to uh, the pandemic uh, in a way that maybe other places we, we hear a lot about different states, Wyoming or Nebraska, what have you, who don't see the crisis in the same way, but they're not as urbanized as places along the Northeast uh, you know, coast. Uh, so that's another factor, I think. And then finally, I think Kierkegaard had a lot to say about modern communication. And this is what I probably will focus most on. But I, it strikes me that that a lot of the sort of there's, there's really two crises, I guess I should say, uh, it, when we're talking about COVID-19. I mean, one crisis is, of course, the medical crisis, right? And how to get a hold of what's going on with, with the coronavirus and, and to what extent can we develop a vaccine or is there a, you know, a pharmaceutical treatment that might help us move on and get you know, back in school and what have you. But the other crisis, I think, is a crisis of information, right? I mean, there, there's a constant question about who's telling the truth. Uh, and you see it on Facebook, you see it on Twitter, you see it on the news. Uh, and every side seems to be claiming that they have, as it were, purchase on the truth. And if only we would just listen to them, the whole thing would be settled. This is what we should do here. This is what we should do there. Uh, and of course, predicted that this is exactly what would happen in, in, a, in a kind of, you know, free press, uh, you know, scenario, right? I mean, if you, if you go back to his encounters 
uh, with the Corsair, right? Uh, it's sort of be really beginning in the late 1845 and then carrying on through much of 1846. I mean, one, one of the concerns with the Corsair, it sort of, you know, sold a great deal of papers using sensationalistic yellow journalism to sort of attract attention and so on. But Kierkegaard didn't think it was only the sort of yellow journalists, right, that would, that would cause this problem. He saw really going back to the 1830s with a lot of his debates in the student union and, and the University of Copenhagen, that the free press itself would create an environment where information would be questionable, constantly doubtful, uh, and leading to more and more reflection. And as we know, that another sort of aspect of this that Kierkegaard raised was that the more reflection, right, the more we get feel paralyzed to do anything. And, and I think a lot of us can sympathize with that right now. Like, you know, oh, this is what I want to do. Wait, no, I just saw another article. I have to wait. No, I, I can't do that right now. I want to go here. I'm going to go there. I don't know what to do. And there's that sense of paralysis. I need to, I need to know more. I need more information. Uh, and then there's also, I think, the phenomenon of leveling, right, which Kierkegaard uh, suggests really emerges from a kind of envy that's, 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 as it were, you know, conjured up by the media, right? There's a sense of like, well, you know, that person said that pretty well, but I think I could say that better. Or I really like what, the way this person put that. And there's a, a kind of constant sort of skepticism regarding uh, the, the quality of our interlocutors, uh, the degree to which we can trust their information and so on. And I think we just see this playing out again, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, on such a grand scale that um, I almost enjoy sending to my friends, you know, here's one article that says this, and here's one article that says that. What are you going to do? Because they can be found anywhere. And, and I know a lot of people want to say that, well, it's just this news outlet that's really guilty of this problem. But I see it personally. I see it in just about every news outlet, really. I mean, there seems to be a great deal of contradiction, uh, even within sort of news outlets and so on. So I think if I were to sort of point somebody, I mean, sort of to, to wrap up here, but I was to point somebody to uh, some key texts uh, written by Kierkegaard that would deal with this. I mean, the first place I would point to uh, would be a literary review. And then I think maybe this somewhat echoes uh, Ada as well. I think I would also look at, at, at texts like The Sickness and the Death or, or even The Postscript, different types of texts to be sure, but I think works that they call people to think more about, to be less reliant, as it were, on the information out there and to think more about the concrete person next to you. Uh, it, it strikes me that, that that's maybe the, the simplest way to deal with this crisis. I mean, in, in a sense, it, it raises you know, the sense of powerlessness that we all have uh, when these sort of global uh, issues arise. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're, 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 we're stuck you know, with the people across the street and next door and I think Kierkegaard would very much appreciate directing one's focus to those, those persons, the neighbor and like in works of love, the next one, right? The one closest to you. So I believe that's it, Aaron. I'll, I think I'll leave it at that for right now. Yeah. One of the things that's exciting about what the work you're doing right now is it's unpacking entirely different dimensions in his text that I was just entirely unaware were even there. And so it, it's exciting work. And thank you so much for sharing it with us today and inviting us to think about it in the, the context of social distancing. It's, it's really a fascinating way to, to look at this issue. So thank you so much. Our next speaker is Sergia Hay. And so Sergia, we'll pass the mic to you. Thanks, Aaron. And Ada and Chris, thanks for what you said. I'm finding that there's already some overlap in what we've been thinking about, maybe. Um, so I'm excited to be part of this conversation and Aaron, thanks for putting it together. So when Aaron first prompted us to think about this, I thought of a bunch of different kinds of issues. So um, Chris, I was thinking about the problem of authority, which is something that you were mentioning. The main things I thought about were, were these three things. So education has really been on my mind. Um, having a lot of conversations with students about online education and how it differs from classroom education. So we've been talking about what is this that we're doing and how should it be done? And I think I particularly think about the lectures on communication, which for me are really lectures on education. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about that. I think uh, Kierkegaard also has a lot to say about health and illness and about all of its varieties. And so that's been something else on my mind. And I've also been thinking about how he connects freedom to anxiety and then I've been thinking about how our lack of physical freedom produces its own set of concerns about um, how we are to reinterpret other kinds of freedom that we have. So in the construction of habits, the 
deliberateness of our actions and all of those kinds of things. So I've been thinking of a lot about all three of those things, but what I wanted to talk about tonight actually is something different. And that's, um, I've been reading uh, The Lily of the Field and the Bird of the Air. And in part three, he makes a connection between perishability and joy, which is so, at first seems so dissonant and strange, but I found that there's so much richness in this that it just really struck me in reading this at this particular moment in time. I think the pandemic has really raised our level of worry. Things that were unstable before this have been revealed in a new way, having to do with economies, uh, our criminal justice system, food security, healthcare system, the treatment of the environment, um, even the stability of higher education right now. I think everything's been thrown into a different kind of light. And so things that were unstable before, right now all of a sudden appear to us in different ways where we're revealed that they're weaker or maybe more unjust. So these problems are more visible. So I've been thinking a lot about worry and about the nature of worry. So this, I've, I've turned to this text because this is where he sermonizes about the passage in Matthew that says, do not worry about your life, about what you will eat and what you will drink, which hits a really strange note right now while we are thinking about sick bodies and about hungry people and about the possibility of more sick bodies and more hungry people um, to include ourselves. And so I've been thinking about, well, what does he say about this? Because it seems so relevant right now. So I read this text again, and what hit me really was this particular pairing, this pairing of perishability and joy in the um, third section, which comes after two different sections about um, silence and obedience. So it was interesting because it's really a fusion of irreconcilables. And we already see this in a lot of Lutheran theology. So Luther pairing sinners and saints and saying that we are free but servant of all. And then we also see it in the sickness unto death where he describes self partly as a synthesis of the finite and the infinite, the temporal and the eternal, and a freedom and necessity. So I've just been musing a lot on, on this third section and particularly what he says about perishability. I'll just provide some quotations here about what he says. And so by perishability, meaning that everything is going to change and pass away, right? He even talks about stars. So it's this idea of zooming out, right? So it's not just that the lily and the bird are perishable and that human beings are perishable, but all, everything, all parts of the creation are perishable. So he says, the whole world with everything in it shall be changed as one changes a garment when it's discarded. And he calls this the prey of perishability. Everything gives way and is prey of uh, perishability. And then joy, which is a very fascinating definition and one that actually surprised me even having read Kierkegaard this long. So he says this, what is joy or what is it to be joyful? It is truly to be present to oneself, but truly to be present to oneself is this today. This to be today, truly to be today. And the truer it is that are today. The more that you are entirely present to yourself in being today, the less does tomorrow, the day of misfortune exist for you. Joy is the present time with the entire emphasis falling on the present time. So I was, I've just been really moved by this. And I think there are four things that have really stood out to me in reflecting on this. The first is um, this idea of being fully present in the now or in, involved in the today has really struck me as, so I've been also been reading Marcus Aurelius's meditations. I find that reading Stoics right now is a really, I highly recommend it. But it's this idea about emphasizing the present as opposed to dealing with an unchangeable past or some kind of unreachable future, right? That really, um, there's something really important about being here now and making a distinction about what can be controlled and what can't be controlled. The other thing that's connected to this is this idea about 
a worried brain always thinking about, well, what about tomorrow? And Kierkegaard really puts an end to that by saying, this is, this is not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to focus on the here and now. He even anticipates this but, but what about tomorrow by saying this? But you say the lily and the bird, of course they can do this, right? And then he says, reply colon, you must not come with any but, but learn from the lily and the bird to be entirely present to yourself and being today as they are, then you too are joy. The second thing I think that's really interesting about this is that really, this is a theme that I've always found really fascinating at Kierkegaard is the failure or the limit of reason. So this pairing of perishability and joy, this presenting of some kind of weird paradox that doesn't seem like it fits together shows these kinds of limits where it's hard for us to hold these things in some kind of really deep fusion, right? That we're more interested in maybe trading one for the other and not holding them together in some kind of really dynamic tension, which represents a kind of a fuller reality. I find that these kinds of pairings that Kierkegaard often does ring so true of what it means to be a self and what the nature of human experience is, um, even if the pairing doesn't make sense, right? But it becomes kind of a source of creative imagining that I think is really helpful. Um, the third thing that I think is interesting about this and is related to this idea about um, reason is that we're not masters of everything and that we have a limited understanding that we can't do anything to change the nature of our perishability, although we would like to, and we, we try to with technology or by keeping ourselves busy so that there's kind of a mirage or an illusion that covers up our perishability. But I think being reminded of this is really important. And then the fourth thing that I, I'm also dwelling on is this idea about thinking about joy as what you are, right? That it's a state of being. Joy is a way of being in the moment rather than something that comes from external conditions. And he's really very clear that it's joy is not something that depends on what happens to you, um, but is actually a kind of a stance that you take in the present moment. So I've been really moved by reading this and i've been talking to some friends who've been reading kierkegaard in these recent days as kind of a devotional reading um, and i think sometimes texts like this can be really helpful especially when we have a lot more time to be introspective thank you sergio so much for those wonderful reflections that that text always has for me been one of the great texts on modeling what trust looks like as a sort of lived practice that moving from silence to obedience to joy is this way of living out, finding yourself, as Ada said, resting in something greater. And as, as Chris has modeled, it, it's hard to rest when the world moves so fast, right? That our, our living is such a speed of technological progression that it's hard for us to slow down and realize, look, the birds might have something figured out. So thank you for those wise words, Sergio. We appreciate it. And our next presenter is Vanessa Rumble. And so, Vanessa, we will turn the mic over to you. Thank you, Aaron. It's, it's wonderful to see Aaron and Sergio today and to meet Ada and Chris. Uh, it's, it's, I'm surprised how much technologically we can create the feeling of almost being in a small room. But I realize I'm the senior dame today, which is a very strange feeling. Also a very strange feeling to be in a five-person academic group with three women. And so I have to, uh, to thank you, Erin, for that. I don't think that's ever happened to me in my entire academic career. Um, but, but that's exciting in itself. So I wanted today just to... Um, I, I guess here in Corona times, as people have mentioned, I am also thinking something about the past and I want to be continuing thoughts that some of you may have heard at previous conferences of pairing uh, Kierkegaard and Martin Luther King Jr. in, in, in their relationship to time, because this is something I want to keep on working on. So I thought I would just take today as an opportunity to do that. Also, I hope that you'll forgive me if I'm sort of on the heavy side, coming at the end, I figure I can move from perishability to just death. <laughs> this, uh, you know, that we know where we are right now. These are, these are serious times for many people. 
So let me just read a little bit and talk uh, through a few things. I think our thoughts really come together very nicely in what we've been reflecting on and what we've been thinking about. And my mind will really hook back to Ada's talk. So Aaron's asked us today to say a few words about Kierkegaard and COVID and to locate some philosophic resources, he said, for a time of crisis. Um, I like to think that Kierkegaard would be largely silent and appropriately modest in the face of the discipline and bravery and endurance that we've seen and continue to see in so many. And in the face of those lifting the weight of this crisis right now, I'm not sure that Kierkegaard would reach first for his intellectual toolkit, or I guess I hope not anyway. But Kierkegaard, as we know from his writings, did want to speak to people in their quiet and lonely hours. And one of the resources I find in him lies less in any prescription he has for us, telling us to do this or that, but more in his descriptive resources, his ability to be a reliable companion on the journey. And someone to whom one might say, is this really what it's like? Is this really what this human life is like sometimes? And part of Kierkegaard's brilliance, I think, lies in cutting through the platitudes that we hold on to in daily life and pushing us further and further off from the shore, far enough out so we reach a place where it's not all to get comfortable to be. As Simon Critchley pointed out the other day in his New York Times forum, The Stone, quote, most of us, most of the time, are encouraged by what passes as normality to live in a counterfeit eternity. We think things stay the same, as Sergi just said. Uh, and there's no question that COVID challenges that assumption and brings us face to face with the fact that COVID or no COVID, we're ultimately just passing through. And all of us, but maybe especially philosophers, want to get our heads above that, outside of that, to, as Kierkegaard would say, to survey that subspecie eternitatis, which we can't do. So all of us, but maybe especially philosophers, want to get our heads above the flux and the disorder of the everyday to see where we stand. What's the latest news? How are the state COVID charts looking? Are friends and family okay? How about ourselves? Are we basically decent people doing our part? Many use Kierkegaard's philosophy and particularly his stages of existence as ways of trying to provide a handy map for locating ourselves spiritually and morally. But others, I guess like myself, see much of his work as offering not maps of existence, but teaching us instead just how desperately we want those maps some way to stand outside of life rather than within it. And I think here, Serge's remarks about perishability and joy are sort of just, it's the difficult space I think he's trying to funnel us into. So just as an illustration of that, but I think a really apt one, my students often hear me talk about Martin Luther King Jr.'s mountaintop speech that he gave in Memphis amazingly the night before he was shot as an example of somebody really opening himself to the uncertainties of standing in time. So King was no doubt that night that his life was constantly in danger and hanging by a thread. They say the shutters were banging on the church where he was speaking and he was jumping because he actually thought it was a gun, which of course it would be the next day. So we know from his father's biography that King had told his mother and father several weeks before that speech that his assassination could happen at any point. But standing in Memphis, in that speech, King walks his audience through many of the battles of liberation in Western history, which was apparently something he tended to do when he was talking. He would sort of also educate and walk people through history. But that day, he imagines, that evening, that God gives him a chance to be part of these other battles, and he turns, or these sort of other revolutions, or freedom movements. So he touches down at different points and talks about Moses and Egypt, Martin Luther and the 99 Theses in Wittenberg, FDR even in the U.S. during the Depression. But in the end, King's point is, he says he wouldn't have wanted to be part of those battles where he could have known the cost and the outcome in advance. 
and would have known, of course, that it was a battle for the good, presumably. But he says instead, and I find these words just amazing, the night before he dies, that he is happy and thankful to be in Memphis because, quote, something is happening here. He doesn't know what. And I think here that, that Kierkegaard really shares this with King, that they're pointing towards a kind of crucifixion that is our temporality itself, that the full experience of it, entering sort of into the really, the defiles of time, you know, into a place where there's no vantage point that would give us knowledge is something about what it is to be a human being. And I think what I especially like here is that there's a sort of, and my students helped me see this because they knew more about it than I did. Greg Convertito, you were here. That King here is leaning on the courage to be, on Tillich, who's leaning on Heidegger, who's leaning on Kierkegaard. And that, that in this movement to embrace time, it, especially in times of fear and anxiety, that somehow those thinkers are standing together hand in hand. So I think that's one thing that Kierkegaard wants us to do is to accept and embrace a kind of flying blind that I think is really difficult to do. If I could do it, I wouldn't be reading this to tell you, to, to tell you the truth. And then there's one other thing I just wanted to point to as others have as well, that of course these times are just emphasizing that we live in a very broken and divided world, obviously, economically, racially, uh, King's battle hasn't landed yet for sure. And, and I'm very aware of, of the lynching in Georgia that just took place. And I think here too, Kierkegaard would not want us to break and run, but to enter within this, and to own what he would call our sinfulness. I don't know really what other word, I don't really have a better word for it, but the point is we can't pull free of it. And so that, that here, this is a difficult part of his thinking, I think, because it is so heavy and it is so dark, but opening ourselves to time, opening ourselves to what Kierkegaard calls our sinfulness, I think he would have thought is ultimately the way that we find each other. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for the wise words and also to bring us in particular in the conversation, recognize that the pandemic doesn't minimize the continued traumas and realities that attend where we find ourselves. And so the reference to the lynching in, in Georgia is definitely something that I think is um, necessarily not to be overlooked when we're all, of course, focused on something that could, I think, mistakenly be described as somehow bigger or more important. It's important to recognize that the singular other always remains singular. Now I want to turn just to a conversation, always the best part of any conference, because we all know what we think, and what's much more compelling is being able to hear what others think when they think with us. Can I begin with a personal question that's also a professional question? A question that comes from really where I am finding myself. I've, I've been really burnt out without really even realizing it. And this time um, at home has let me realize how tired I am. <laughs> and it's been good, really good. So I'm really burnt out, but I'm also having such just truly existential questions about the meaning of all of the work that we do. Not so much teaching. I always know teaching is meaningful and I always feel it, but um, what to work on and the value of different projects. Um, that, that is all so open for me right now. And for those of us who work on existential philosophy, I, I think it's such a lovely prompt maybe. So I'd love to know if anybody else is feeling like this is also, this is quite a moment for existential crisis, <laughs> professionally speaking. Um, and I'd love to hear where you're at, especially maybe in relation to Gerhard or even, or even not, even more beyond. I want to talk about your know, extra visits to the, you know, to the liquor store, what have you. I mean, no, I mean, I think it's, um, I, I, I think it is, it's a time uh, to go back a little bit to what I spoke about. I mean, it's a time where you know, there's so much uncertainty that, you know, you don't know the value of the project you're currently working on, or you don't know if you're going to be teaching in person next semester, or if, you're, or if it's going to be something online and how that might impact the way you go about the course. And I think 
those times of uncertainty, as I think really every speaker has, has addressed in some way or another, sort of breed a kind of anxiety that, that Kierkegaard deeply speaks to. So um, uh, I, I, do, I do very much identify with that. I don't know uh, if the answer is anything other than what you know, Sergio or Vanessa or, or yourself alluded to, right, about sort of trying to find the, the sort of uh, inner synthesis, right, that would, uh, that, that would ground one amidst such anxiety. My 14 year old daughter in the first week of the pandemic when she was at home looked at me and asked, why do anything? And she wasn't in a moment like to give up or just roll over or whatever, but it, I think it brought all those questions that you were just asking about really to the forefront because when we're involved in a busy day to day schedule and are tired and are just trying to keep up, those questions get crowded out that are always there, right? And so in a certain sense, this has made so many things visible. I talked about how this makes things like food insecurity visible and a, and a messed up criminal justice system visible, but it also makes our own, like what's our, what's our purpose? What is our, why are we here? What are we, what are we doing this for? And so it was really thrilling to hear a 14 year old ask that because her busyness stopped, at least paused for a little bit and she was able to ask that question. So I was thrilled. And of course, you know, she has two parents. <laughs> I think everything can be solved with books, which is not true. But we we're like, let's start a reading group. So that's, she's been reading Marcus Aurelius with us. And, but that's not really it, because it's really to be found, I think, in the walks that we take with her and the, the creation of a new kind of order to the day. Um, and one in which we find joy, but one in which we also confront the realities of the difficult time that we're in. I just want to add that I'm blown away that your 14 year old is reading Marcus Aurelius. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure she really enjoyed it. I, it. <laughs> I had a student ask me recently, in, in all sincerity, kind of echoing what Serge's daughter said. She said, look, graduation has been canceled. The summer internship ha is gone. The job that I was expecting to move into in the fall no longer exists. And she said, what good does it do for me to continue planning for what is called the future? It seems to me that maybe the future is not a thing that plans make any sense in relation to. And my response to her was basically, well, look, when was that ever not the case? You know, we, we, we act as if in normal times we're guaranteed 80 plus years or whatever. And yet one of the things I think that, you know, Marcus Aurelius and, and Stoics more broadly kind of help us remember is, shoot, the, the, the today is ultimately all we have. And I think one of the tricky things is then how do we balance planning for that which is uncertain and then just throwing our hands up and saying, look, it's uncertain. So what's the point in planning? And so somehow neither of those uh, quite work right now. And, and I think that uh, one of the weird things about studying existential philosophy is it reminds you part of why we like studying it might be because we're bad at just existing really well. Uh, you know, if, if we were really good, we'd go surfing with Aaron James or somebody and, and, and you know, write the books afterwards. But I, so, yeah, I, I think these are really, really important questions. Um, and they kind of also, I think, throw us up against our own limitations, even as teachers. Being vulnerable in front of students is something I think we always should do. Maybe right now, the best thing we can do is, is sort of show them that living in trauma is something that is shared, right? And, and maybe that's something that on its own is powerful. Chris, one of the weird things that I have found in the pandemic is the fact that my social media feed is as divisive as anything I have ever seen. And it's almost as if the data, the evidence, the arguments run in entirely two different ways. How is it that you see social media functioning being a resource for something like, you know, social building and community building? Because right now it certainly seems like it's doing the opposite. Well, this is a question I, I taught a PhD seminar in the fall, ironically enough, about you know just technology and we had we had a sort of section on social media we read Kierkegaard we read a number of other people Sherry Turkle again I'll reference her um and it was one of the things we kept coming back to was to what extent can the, these sort of media outlets function as you know sources for community or 
can, can they actually be vehicles for, for love in a, in a kind of, you know, Christian sense? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't, I think one can argue that they, they can function that way. I don't know that you can argue from Kierkegaard that they can function in that way. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think, you know, one reason why is I think he's got this, this, this great skepticism about, uh, you know, the crowd and the sort of cacophony of voices. And I, I think, you know, it's okay, right? We don't have to agree with Kierkegaard on everything. And I, and I think there, there are a sort of opportunities or functions within social media that, that perhaps don't have to lead down a, a road of, of divisiveness, as you as you put it, Aaron. But um, I think he was very skeptical uh, about sort of everybody having a forum. Everybody, I think he would be totally unsurprised by by the rancor and the arguments that unfold on Twitter, uh, because he already saw that emerging uh, in the press of his own day. I mean, uh, there's a there's a journal passage where he talks about. Uh, running into people on the streets during the Coursera affair, and, and he references a couple. I think one of them is like the night watchman, and the other is a bartender. And both of them have come to totally different sort of conclusions regarding the Corsair's treatment of him. You know, one is sort of feels sorry for him and thinks he's like getting picked on, which of course offended Kierkegaard. And then, and then the other one, as I recall, uh, you know, felt like he had, was he was a slime ball, right? And that you know that the Corsair totally got it right, you know. And uh, and Kierkegaard is like. You know, neither side is exactly understanding this correctly, but this is what happens when you have subscribers and gossip, and 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 it's it almost feeds off of itself. Uh, and uh, this is something I've reflected a great deal upon is that I, I don't I don't know that that this can be brought to a halt, as it were, uh, by by the the technological sort of media themselves, right? I think the individual has to bring it to a halt in some way. And, uh, and that's where I, get, I do, I, I share Nicholas Carr's concerns, for example, about, about how it almost changes the way we understand or relate to one another. I know relationships, even you know, very intimate relationships can be strained by just, let's say, the, the kind of interactions one has on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, so to tie it back to your question, Aaron, I mean, I, I think I've tried to keep it light <laughs> on, on social media these days. You know, hey, did you see that movie? Uh, you know, whatever. Um, I don't know that that's the best response. Sometimes I feel kind of, you know, ridiculous, you know, like, you know, it's like, oh, there, here's me and my daughter or whatever. But at the same, because there's so much serious stuff going on. But uh, I don't know that that's even necessarily the worst way to go about it, because I think there, there is a sense in which for Kierkegaard, if we engage in leveling, we perpetuate that, that sort of way of interaction. So, uh, you know, in a way, for Kierkegaard, leveling is the great danger of modernity. And uh, if we can do our best to avoid it, I think he would probably advise that we do so. Aaron, I'm wondering how you get the courage to do the posting that you do on, on the internet, because I, I marvel at it every time. I'd love to hear how you approach handling that every yeah. day. So I think that one of the really surprising things about social media is it has actual risk. Now, I, I have not faced any of that, right? So when I get called a heretic, it's usually, you know, by somebody at my church, <laughs> who I, I'm not, you know, fearful of that engagement. <laughs> I, I will, it doesn't come without personal cost, I guess is my point, right? For me, it, it, it weighs heavily on me, because I take discursive hospitality so seriously, that I'm always trying to find a way to say, all right, what am I missing? about the view that I think is absolutely bizarre. Or I don't think reasonable persons could think that P, and yet I've got someone claiming P? Like, how is this possible? And this is a person I interact with when I go to Walmart or whatever. How do we navigate that? And I, I, I would say, I don't think it's courage. Uh, I think it genuinely is about two years ago, when, when, or three years ago now, when Trump got elected, um, it threw such a wrench in my own traditional evangelical identity, uh, and it actually caused me to have to abandon those monikers and that identifying phrasing, and, and I had to narrate myself differently to try to break from what it was I saw my own communities doing. Um, so now I identify as a Pentecostal still, but not as an evangelical. And so in some ways, when that happened, I realized that the only way that I could look my son in the face was to try to stand in ways that if he ever looked at my public record as data, 
w would it be the kind of narrative that would invite him to live the sort of life that you talk about with MLK, that all of us have talked about with Kierkegaard, though I don't think we want to model his personal life. The, the, uh, the isolation as a, as a way of living is, is two and a half months is quite enough for me. But I guess that's my response is, is the necessity to try to live a life that I want my son to see caused me to have to say, I no longer can be quite so hidden and try to be so objective and try to, you know, kind of keep cards close to my chest, though I appreciate Chris's, uh, you know, cat pictures and, and you know, things. It, it's, for me, it eventually became just too hard to do that. And I will say, I think if I had not been raised evangelical, if I didn't still identify as Pentecostal, I don't think this would be the same case for me. So it's because I still stand in some of those spaces that I refused to allow my standing there to be confused with what it was that so many others perceived it as meaning. Um, and recently, in fact, to show you the opposite side, uh, one of a friend of mine, dear friend, I take very seriously, and he reached out to me and said, man, I'm getting really frustrated with all of your posts and with the way that you interact with people on Facebook. And I was like, dude, I'm so sorry. What, what have I done? And he said, you still act like these other people are reasonable. And I said, you know, he's speaking about conservatives and some of the, again, that very smaller group of my Facebook friends, but who were saying things like, this is ridiculous, you know, yay Trump or whatever. And I, my response always is, thanks for the engagement. I'm trying hard to make sense of what you're saying. Here's where I think it's going awry. Help me see what I'm missing. And he said, in doing this, I was becoming one of the white moderates that King, in fact, had no time for because I was still allowing those voices to count. And I admit that that cut me to the quick because it was like, shoot, <laughs> I, you know, it, I'm trying so hard to maintain the conversation and yet stand where I think I need to stand. And yet in doing this, I've got one side thinking that I'm a heretic and I'm a coward and I'm, you know, biased and it'd be a, a horrible thing to send their kids to work with me. And on the other side, I've got, you know, progressive friends of mine saying I'm a sellout and really just a conservative Christian after all. I, I don't know how to do it well, but, but I keep trying to do what I think is, is the only thing that I can sleep at night having done. So. Hope you don't mind me directing another question to Aiden. This isn't very well formulated, but it has to do with where you stand. And I thought it was fascinating that you started saying you were standing in Native American, let you you had the proper noun. Sorry, it's but but what is it like to teach Kierkegaard there? I love the question. We could ask, what is it like to teach anything? And Canada is a settler nation. The United States is a settler nation. We had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, and so now one of the practices is land acknowledgement. But um, a more radical and very vexed response is to indigenize our universities and indigenize our curriculum and we're all doing not all some, some people are not um, but most of us in fact this is what Aaron was just talking about there's a vulnerability to the we that is spiritual and moral and existential and also political um, so some folks do not want to indigenize but for most of us we're committed to doing it so for instance pairing Billy Ray Belcourt with Anticlimacus is philosophically helpful, I think, to have a contemporary thinker who has a logic that really aligns with the sickness and the death. And yet, um, Billy Ray's is an, it's a decolonizing project. So it, it, it invites a reading, a way to read, I think, which is great. Uh, it implicates us in, in methods of reading. I sometimes get frustrated that in philosophy, the question of reading is not always at the forefront, whereas say in English, um, or anthropology even, in a lot of other disciplines, religious studies, method is so um, part of the creative and critical endeavor. And so <laughs> um, this is why conversations about pedagogy and Kierkegaard are very welcome and very important, it strikes me, um, because it invites these kinds of even very simple, so my, my, question, my answer is just very simple, what does it mean to teach Kierkegaard in the settler nations that we are a part of? It, um, I think it presents us with a political and, and pedagogical challenge of how we teach, even in the most simple way of, of curricular choices, pairing texts, um, and then also the kinds of exercises and assignments that we present, that we curate for our students and, and walk them through. 
Sergia, a question that I have about the way that you navigated perishability and the relation to joy is how do you see that? You, you mentioned your daughter. How is it that you teach that intersection? Because I know with my 10 year old, we are having a really hard time trying to help him make sense of joy today because he thinks joy today happens because he's expecting joy tomorrow <laughs> that, you know, we will get to the beach, you know, in July, which we now won't, or then we'll see grandma in June, which we now aren't. So how is it that you're able to narrate and, and present this in ways that invite your kids to be able to live into it? Because I know I'm really not doing it well. I don't think I'm doing it well either. I mentioned the, the lectures on communication when I spoke and it was this distinction between communicating knowledge and communicating capability that I think is so interesting in Kierkegaard because capability has to do with religious and moral education, which is I think what you're talking about. And that that has to be something that's modeled, not something that's said, right? So it was our error to like look to books right away, but we were hoping that through the conversation and deliberation with each other that things could be answered. But I remember also in the first weeks of teaching online that a student asked me, what are you looking forward to? And I found that to be such an uplifting question because everything just seemed really hard at the moment, switching to online format and um, things were really scary. We didn't know what the curve would look like the next day and the numbers of deaths. And there's so little known about the disease and its transmission and why it affects certain people. And so the question of what are you looking forward to, which is a question about tomorrow and about the future, was something that actually was very wonderful to think about. And so I think this question about joy as being something in the present, but it was the her asking that and then us being able to share that in that moment, that was really the thing. Yeah, I think, you know, also trying to, Think about how attitudes of students have changed over the course of this time too. I know that at the beginning there was so much resistance to moving online and feeling that they were really missing out on the classroom experience and the spontaneous sharing of ideas and all of the things that we value that takes place in the classroom to kind of an evolving sense of, well, this is what we're dealing with and we still have opportunities for connection and finding that in small groups like this, that's more likely to happen in a Zoom of 30. Yeah, reinterpreting our experience, I think. That's a great question. I, I don't know. My answer is I don't know. <laughs> Always the best answer in philosophy as far as I'm concerned. I was gonna say that may be the theme for the, the whole evening, right? Everybody keeps referring to uncertainty and the unknowable and so on. So good summary. Uh, sort of a uh, way, good way to sum up the whole sort of discussion, I think. That's true. And, and maybe as a, a way of closing out, uh, a question for Vanessa that builds on what you've just said, Sergia, but connects to your consideration of MLK, which is one of the great things that King offers is a narrative of hope, right? You know, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. One of the great things that John Davenport has actually critiqued in my own work uh, for years is that my own Levinasian sensibilities didn't have enough eschatological hope that he thinks Kierkegaard offers, right? And I think he's entirely wrong about my own reading of Kierkegaard, but his, his emphasis is exactly right. That, that hope, I think, has to be somehow part of what that joy for the lily and the bird look like. Because the thing is, they're not worried because their hope is not anchored in, oh, well, tomorrow I will be able to. But their hope is somehow manifest as a lived reality today. So I'd love for you maybe to, to finish this up by thinking, what do you see as hopeful for where we find ourselves? And how can Kierkegaard maybe speak to our shared hopes? Well, you know, again, a theme I think that speaks to my great age <laughs> is that the older I get, you know, I'll rediscover these things in Kierkegaard, like uh, I mentioned to you earlier that I was seeing these similarities between Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, and I didn't mention it or I couldn't weave it into what I was doing tonight, but it's like 
the way and this is very much speaks, I think, to Chris's theme, you know, that they saw that we were going to lose the sense that this life is ours. You know, that that we, I mean, granted, yeah, our freedom's limited, all that, but that that we have a life to live. And I mean, yes, it ends, but all the more we have the great adventure and like to seed this to all the various forces. You know, a, another little example I didn't get to work in is watching this commercial every morning, my husband and I watch it, about the before and after of these people that are trying to get rid of the wrinkles or the furrows in their brows. And every time I look at this, and it's unreal, I think the before is the same as the after. You are looking at your aging face. This is the promise we have a life it does not last forever we can live it it's so I, I just think it is the great adventure and need and and i guess i've heard this so many times you know that that they understood that we were losing this but it struck me more forcefully this time teaching it to students that that uh how afraid we are to take our lives you know to live our lives sometimes I feel like we'd sell it for a dime, you know, let anybody else live it. That's despair, right? But what about the hope that we get to? I think one of the ways that we live our lives is by inhabiting questions that matter. This is what I invite my students to every single day. And we always start my intro to philosophy class by reading David Foster Wallace's This Is Water. And we end the very last day by reading David Foster Wallace's This Is Water. And the whole idea is pay attention to what you think is obvious because it probably isn't, right? We should put question marks where everyone else puts periods. So I want to end tonight by asking each of you, what is a question into which you are currently living? And we'll uh, start with Vanessa and do a backwards jaunt to Ada and you'll, you'll finish this up tonight, Ada. So Vanessa, what is a question into which you are currently living? Well, I guess I'm thinking about Kierkegaard and shame. Uh, so I guess that's the opposite of what it is to not quite be able to, to step into your own life. That's wonderful. What about you, Sergio? What's a question into which you are living? I think um, as a teacher, because I've been just thinking about education so much, is how to know how to ask the right question and when is the right time. So, so, so hard. Chris, what about you? I could probably come up with questions, but uh, I, I suppose one would be, uh, to what extent can we trust our institutions and at what point, at, at what point do we sort of give up on them uh, or do, at what point do we invest more deeply? Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, wow. And Ada, wrap us up. What do you think is a question into which your current existence is, is being made manifest? I am pondering the mystery of the we, <laughs> the question of how I relate to my community and how we relate to our communities. And because I attend Quaker meeting, uh, an unprogrammed friends Quaker meeting, um, that practically that translates into silence. So I'm also pondering the mystery of silence. I long ago had a fantasy of writing an article called Was Kierkegaard a Quaker? Which is obviously, no, he wasn't. <laughs> but the silence, the Quaker silence, it just maps so be beautifully onto so many insights from Kierkegaard. And um, I am also pondering that. Hey, Ada, I'll jump in on that. I, I had a Quaker student a few years ago who swore to me that Kierkegaard was a Quaker. Oh. And then my, my wife and two of my boys go to a Quaker school in Philadelphia. Whoa. So uh, who knows, right? <laughs> I am not alone in wondering this. You're not, alone. You're not alone. I'm filled with delight at sharing this question. Thank you so much. Well, let me just say to Sergia, Ada, Chris, and Vanessa, thank you all so much. It really is, as Vanessa, you said, somehow technology makes it possible for us to share spaces despite the fact that our bodies are in different locations and that phenomenology of shared space th this we tonight here now this has been something that has genuinely been life-giving to me and so thank you all for your words your wisdom for your vulnerability and the questions that continue to animate your life 
to all of our viewers. Thank you so much for watching. We hope that this has benefited you and given you some encouragement for continuing to move forward in uncertain times. On behalf of the Sword and Kierkegaard Society, let me invite you to visit our website, to check out the events that we've got coming up, to potentially join the membership. We have an amazing community, an amazing intellectual group of people who think well, who try to live well, and who do it while celebrating each other in the process. So on behalf of the Soren Kierkegaard Society, thank you to our panelists and our participants tonight. And to all of you, we'll see you next time. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.